so proud of our team. Pastor Brian mentioned a few moments ago about your giving. What does your giving do? It does so much. We'll celebrate more of that here at our annual business meeting that will be coming up at the end of February. But just a just to point to one of them. That video that you saw of our Christmas Eve service, we were able to step out of this venue to, to raise the bar of excellence, to take our Christmas Eve service to a whole new level because of your giving. We received an offering that night, but we just did that because uh, we give people the opportunity to give. If they wanted to give, they could uh, to give folks that might not be here to give their tithes and offerings at the services coming later that week that they'd have an opportunity to give. But we didn't have to receive an offering to pay for that. We didn't have to receive, we had the finances, the funds to be able to do those kind of things because of your faithfulness. And so let me tell you, 1,150 people came to that service. We had another 176 that watched online. So we had a total of over 1,400 people that were a part of that service. We had one of our missionary families in Mexico was watching online. They were being able to. So when you hear 176 or 150 or 250 uh, online guests, that's just one IP address. The average says that you could multiply that by 1.5 because usually there's at least one and a half people, uh, uh, the, the way the math would go, sitting around a video screen watching that. So, so we have numbers of 1,400 plus that were a part of that service that night. Had 13 people that gave their heart to Christ in that service that day. That's because of your giving because you said, I'm going to give to my church. I'm going to be faithful and our church is able to step out and do things like that. And there's 13 people that came to Jesus on that service that will be in heaven someday when you get there because you paid to help have that service. That should make you rejoice right there. So with that said, let's look at Abraham. Let's look at, uh, I, uh, well, I was going to say Isaiah. Abraham's not in Isaiah. Abraham is in Genesis. Look at, look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1 through 18. Actually, I'll probably stop at verse 8. <clears throat> you can read the rest of them on your own. So you know the story here. Abraham and Sarah have had Isaac. Now the time has come, Scripture says. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham... Abraham said, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the re region of Mor Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. On one of the mountains that I will tell you about, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for the burnt offerings, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Next, latter part of that verse. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, how many of you have read this passage before? Let me see your hand. Yeah. I've read this passage many times. And as I was reading through it again this morning, right before my message, a word popped out to me, a phrase that I had not seen in this, message, in this passage. And as I said in the first two services, uh, we tend to sometimes read Scripture and we, we glaze over it. We read it. And I'm not saying you don't listen to it, but we read over it and we just go on and we don't stop and look at what the Scriptures are really saying. You ever looked at one of those pictures on the wall that's got like 15 billion dots on them and they say stare at it for 30 seconds look away and look back and you'll see the picture in there you ever done that before okay me and only three others I have never yet had that to happen to work for me I still when I look I can look at it for 30 seconds look away look back I still see the same 15 billion dots we do that with scripture sometimes and the thing that I passed over in here says you remember, what's, what is Abraham going to do? Sacrifice who? His only son. So the Lord told him that, right? He says, it's a test. Take your son and go there, and he's going to sacrifice him. Notice what he says here. They've gotten to this point, and he says, he told his, when they got to the point, he told his servants to stay there. He said, I and the boy are going to go over there, and we will worship, and we'll come back. We is more than one. So if it was Isaac and if it was Abraham and Isaac going up and, and one was going to get sacrificed, how many in the natural are supposed to be coming back? We is not one. We is more than one. 
So what is Abraham doing here? Abraham is speaking faith in a season when he has nothing. He's speaking faith in a season of when he has nothing. Now somebody didn't listen to me when I prayed that prayer about turning phones off. So I'd really like for you to turn your phones off if you would please or put them on silent. Because there's some words that God's going to speak to you today. And I don't want you getting a text message or a Facebook notification or a news feed that will distract you and cause you to miss a word that could be revolutionizing to your life today. We can give God these 35 minutes. I promise you, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that will be fine. They'll be there when church is over with, okay? So notice he, so let's, let's read on. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he and himself carried the fire and the knife. He, and verse, goes on to say, and as the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Again, Abraham is speaking faith in a season of nothing. What does it have to do with us? Because we are no different from Abraham other than the fact he hasn't called any of us to sacrifice our children. But he's, just as, he's, as God has spoken, spoke to Abraham then to go step out and sacrifice, give up something that was extremely precious to him. God may ask you to give up something that's very precious to you or for you to give something out of your out of your resources and you're looking at it and go, but I don't really have what, I, what you're asking me to give, but I've found out that if I will just obey the Lord and speak faith in those seasons of nothing, God always comes through, excuse me, I didn't mean to whistle there, that God always comes through for me and he will always come through for you. So I want to talk to you today on the subject of faith isn't linear, faith is exponential. Faith isn't linear, linear. Faith is exponential. And so I came across this story as I was preparing for this message. And there's a a lady by the name of 1983, Lorraine Whitehead, published an article in the American Journal of Physics about the domino chain reaction. When you knock over one domino, it sets a chain of reactions that can knock down hundreds of dominoes in a matter of seconds. Maybe you've done that as a child. But the unique significance of her research was this, that she discovered, discovered was a domino is capable, one domino right here, is capable of knocking over a domino that is one and a half times its size. For instance, she found out in her, in her research that a two-inch domino can topple a three-inch domino. A three-inch domino can topple a four and a half-inch domino and so on. And by the time that you get to the 18th domino, there's enough energy being uh, transferred that you could knock over the leaning tower of Pisa. So in the realm of mathematics, there are two kinds of, uh, there's two, two times of progression. There's what's called linear, pro- linear and exponential. Linear progression is 2 plus 2 equals what? 4. In exponential prog- in progression, it's called compound doubling. In linear, it's 4 times 4 equals 16. But, in, but if you take 30 linear steps, you are 90 feet from where you started. But if you take 30 exponential steps, you've circled the earth 26 times. I read that in Mark Batterson's book, Chase the Lion. You can find that on page 155. So here's the point. Every decision that I make, every decision that you make, every risk that we take has a chain reaction, and those chain reactions set off thousands of other chain reactions that we're not even aware of or that we can even imagine. Think about that. And and that sometimes only eternity will fully reveal the impact of those decisions. So today I want to talk about the subject of linear faith versus exponential faith linear faith versus exponential so the first thing is this when it comes to our faith we tend to think of our decisions in present time we tend to think of our decisions in present time good or bad uh and give an example let's say um that we you make a decision and and you uh don't really put a whole lot of thought into that that decision and 
uh, six months down the road or a month down the road or six years down the road or ten years, or whatever, a, a, a whole decade, you look back over that and you go, man, I didn't, it never dawned on me when I made that decision back at so-and-so time. I never in my wildest dreams imagined how that decision would affect today, good or bad, good or bad. I think about my mother. When my mother, I love, my mother is my mother. I loved her. I wish my mom was still here. But my mom made a decision when she was younger to start drinking. Little did my mother know that she had a chemical makeup in her body, that her body was, was, was prone to, uh, to, I don't know how to explain all this, but she was very susceptible to become an alcoholic. And she did. I don't think my mother, when she took that very first drink, that, she, that her goal in life was, I'm going to turn out to be an alcoholic and I'm going to die as soon as I can. But she made that decision to begin to drink alcohol. And that decision that she made at whatever age that was robbed her of many things. It robbed her of seeing her children grow up. It robbed her of her marriage. It robbed her of her own health. It robbed her of seeing her son graduate from college. It robbed her of seeing her son get married. It robbed her of grandchildren and, and eventually great-grandchildren someday down the road. It, it robbed her of all of those things. And, and so I would say that if, if and, and my mother died at the age of 45 years old, I would imagine that I, I can probably imagine that as my mother got older in life, that when she looked back on those decisions, that she would have probably said that was a bad decision that I did not realize would have the kind of chain reaction effect that it's had. That was a bad one. But let's think of others that you make a decision to say, I'm going to, you're standing at a crossroads in your life, and you say, I'm, I go this way. And maybe that decision was to go off to college. That decision was to walk away, away from some destructive friendships and relationships, and you chose to go another way. And now you look back on that 20 years later, and you look back on those people that you used to associate with, and you look at the destruction and the pain and the way that their life is went, and you look at yours because maybe you chose to follow God. You chose to go to college. You chose to date somebody else else and you look at your wife, you look at your children, you look at your marriage, you look at your career and you go, man, when I was making that decision when I was 18 years old, I, I, I did not have, it did not come to me or I didn't have a clue on how turning and going this way made a huge difference versus if I turned and went that way. You see, a lot of times we look at our decisions that they're just present tense, but they have, but they have chain reactions that go to the second and the third and the fourth generations. See, I imagine that when Abraham was going up that mountain, going to sacrifice Isaac, that he wasn't thinking about the second, third, and the fourth generation. He wasn't thinking about Jacob, his grandson. He wasn't thinking about Joseph, his great-great-grandson. He was thinking about, God, how am I going to get up this mountain? How am I going to get through this and get back home and, and get Isaac back home with me with Sarah? Because if I come back without my, my boy, I'm going to have to pay a heavy price with Sarah. Now, you're not going to find that in the Bible. That was all the JHV version, okay? But you give me a little latitude here. You know what I'm talking about. I'm using that to make a point. But he was looking at getting through this. He wasn't looking at the second, third generation, but third, fourth generation. But what you and I have to remember is this, is that God doesn't all, is not just looking at present tense. God is looking at the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth generations beyond where we're at at this very moment. Verse 17 of chapter 22, the Lord says to, because of, you remember we go through the story here, we know what happens, that, uh, that uh, uh, Abraham is obedient, God provides the ram in the thicket for, to be sacrificed instead of Isaac, and so look what the scripture says to, the Lord, to, uh, to Abraham, read it out loud with me again, it says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. So I want you to look at this verse again. We have a tendency sometimes to read the, read the passage, but, read, but look past the full meaning and, and the promises. So look at the first two words of that verse, and I want you to say them out loud with me. Verse 17, the first two words. 
I will. Who is I will? Who is I? It's God. So circle that in your Bible right there. That is a promise that God made to Abraham, but that's, that's a promise that God makes to you and I. God does not make hollow promises. God doesn't just make promises for the sake of making promises. He doesn't speak hollow words. If God says, I will do something, God will do something. And so because of Abraham's faithfulness, because of Abraham's obedience to be willing to go and to, and to do what God had told him to do, he says, I will surely bless you. And notice in there, and make your descendants. Descendants represent generations, numerous generations, stars in the sky. Your descendants beyond you, Abraham, after you die, Abraham, when you're long and gone, Abraham, your descendants. Remember, who's, what's Abraham's title? He's called the father of what? Many nations or many generations. And it all goes back to because one man chose to make a decision to be obedient. His present tense decision had exponential results. Think about this. <clears throat> if Abraham, Abraham had not taken the steps of faith and obeyed God. What might have happened? We don't know. But here's what we do know. Because he did follow through. He was faithful. This is what we do know. Because of his obedience, Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons was called who? Joseph, the youngest. And because of Joseph, he was sold into slavery. You know the story. He had many, he had many injustices done to him. But in every injustice, the Lord elevated him. The Lord gave him favor. The Lord promoted him. That should be a, a, that should be a promise or a, an encouragement to all of us that whenever someone does an injustice to us, remember that God is the one who keeps a good set of books and God is your vindicator. God is your restorer. God is your defender. God will always elevate you and I even when injustice has been done wrong to us. Or uh, that would be the same thing, injustice done wrong to us, when injustice has been done to us. So you know the story that, that ultimately Joseph, because he was elevated, that God used his plight for the future generations. That when the land was in a severe famine, that he had the foresight to store up grain. He had, as I've said in other services, he had the business acumen. He had the favor. He had the wisdom to store up for the lean years. And his brothers came. And his brothers did exactly what was prophesied in Scripture, that they bowed down to him. You remember in his, in his dream and they got mad at him because they said, you think we're going to bow down to you, little runt? You're our little brother. You bow down to us. You know, that's the way it went. But ultimately, Joseph saved the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you think that Abraham was thinking about that? Did Abraham even know that? Did he even have in his mind that that would happen? No. He was thinking about my son, sacrificing my son. How do I get through this? God, you've got to provide something for me. He was looking at present tense, but God was looking at it exponentially. That God was saying, Abraham, what you're doing today is not just going to affect you, but what you're doing today, Abraham, is going to have an effect on the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and generations beyond that, and beyond that, and beyond that. Leads me to my second point this morning. When it comes to our faith, God takes our little and makes much of it. God takes our little and makes much of it. Look with me at Ephesians 3.20. This is our, our theme scripture for the year. Read it out loud with me. To him who by means of his power work... Everybody, I can't hear you. Read it out loud with me now. Come on. To him who is by his means of his power working in us is able to do so much more than we could ever ask for or even think of. How? By his power. So he takes our little and he makes much of it, right? Remember that old song, little becomes much when it's placed in the master's hands? He takes our little and he adds exponential to it. Let me show you, give you an example in scripture of exponential faith. First of all, if you take five and you add two to it, so five plus two equals seven. seven. Very good. So yeah, all of you passed basic math. 
Five plus two equals seven. So let's look at the scripture here. How many loaves, you remember the story here there, that Jesus has been teaching, the multitudes are following him, that it's late in the day, they need something to eat, he wants the disciples to go buy the food, they said we don't have any money, it's too late to go into town, get food and bring it back, blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. So Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? He asks, go and see. Figure it out, work the problem. When they found out, they said five and two. Five plus two equals seven. Let's read on. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people to sit down in the groups on the gra green grass. Ooh, green grass. I'm looking forward to that. How about you guys? So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish. Five plus two equals how many? All right. Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. Remember, they're, they're distributing five fish, five loaves and two fish. He also divided the two fish among them all them all they all ate and were what satisfied shortly here some of you are going to go eat and you're going to be satisfied and you're going to go home take a nap and then you're going to come back at 6 30 tonight and you're going to worship off all that that you ate for lunch verse 43 and the disciples picked up how many 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish and the number of the men who had eaten were was 5,000 now remember back in biblical times they didn't count men they didn't count women and children so scholars say, historians say that more than likely there were somewhere between 15 and 16,000 people that were fed off five fish and two loaves. So in linear faith, five plus two equals seven. In exponential faith, five plus two equals 15,000. Wow, that's all I got out of that. Five plus two in exponential faith equals 15,000. Little becomes much when it's placed in the master's hands. Little becomes much when it's placed in the master's hands. That is what exponential faith looks like. Your money will go where you can't go and your money will do more than you could ever do. You said, why are you talking about money? Because money is very precious to all of us. Money is how life works. And we love our money. And we are hopefully good stewards with our money. And we're careful, should be careful about where you invest your money. But the reason I mentioned that about money is because that's usually one of the things that most often that God asks us to give up. That God asks us to invest in something. And we look at every scenario and we try to figure out every way that we can sometimes keep from giving what God wants us to give. We're willing to give everything else. We're willing to trust him with our soul. We're willing to trust him with our children. We're willing to trust him with, with our jobs. We're willing to trust him with our health. But we're not always willing to trust God with our money. And which one's going to last the longest? Our souls are. So if we can trust him with our souls, why can't we trust him with our finances? In 1990, we had a young lady that was in our youth group in Georgia. Her name was Kim. Kim was going off to Bible college in and uh, we, had, we had encouraged her to go to Bible college, and she was getting ready to head off to go to Southeastern University. And, and we were going by to tell her bye one afternoon, and the Lord said to me, I want you to give Kim $100. Well, at that time in our life, we were both unemployed, Angie and I. And I told God I didn't have $100, and the Lord reminded me that I do. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, yes, you do. And here I am arguing with the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sufficient God, you know, all-powerful, all all-knowing, all-present God. And so I had $100 that I'd been saving, so I went and got it out of the box that I had up in my bedroom, up in the closet, and I got it, and we took it over, and I gave it to Kim, and we made a $100 investment into Kim's life. So remember, that was a linear decision that I made. A linear decision that I was making, giving it. Little did I know that, that my little being placed in her hands, what God would do with that. Kim went off to Bible college. Kim met her husband. They became, they graduated. They both went to, uh, they went to New Jersey. They became youth pastors. They felt after a period of time there that God was calling them to the mission field. And so Kim and Mark applied for mission appointment. And they became missionaries in Africa uh, for nearly 20 plus years as children's evangelists. And they led many, many children into the kingdom of God. Every child that Kim and Mark Gardner brought into the kingdom of God, me and my family have a part in that because of that 100 
$100 that we invested, that Angie and I, when we didn't have 100 extra to give, that we invested into Kim's life. I was looking at it as a linear thing. God, this is $100 that I'm saving up for a rifle, for a new hunting rifle that I want, that I, 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 me, 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 that I want. But God's saying, I want you to invest in the life of a young lady that I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly far more than you, that she, than they could ever ask or think. So every soul that's come into the kingdom of God so far in their ministry, I've had a part in that. I get to reap a harvest from that. Guess what? Every soul that they have won into the kingdom of God over the last several years since this church has been supporting them, you and this church reap a harvest from that. That offering that you give every month towards your mission's commitment goes to pay some 145 missionaries that we support all around the world. And so you're giving, you're writing that check, you're going to PayPal, ever how you pay it, and you're writing it out, and you're looking at it as linear but God is saying I am looking at it exponentially that you're giving that money and I'm going to take it and it's going to Africa it's going to China it's going to Turkey it's going to this country that country and there are people there that's receiving a monthly check that are on the harvest field there and they're reaching souls that you will never ever see until you cross the gates into heaven and they're going to be standing there and they're going to go I am in this kingdom I am here eternally because you gave you were looking at it linear but I was but God was looking at it exponentially and because you gave I have eternal life. Never look at what you do for God as something in present tense. Always look at it in future tense. And remember that your little, my little, becomes much when it's placed in the hands of the master. Mark Batterson says in his book, Chase the Line, he says, if you, you and I do little things like they're big things, then God will do big things like they're little things. Leave that up there so folks can copy that down. If you and I do the little things, our little becomes much. When we do little things like they're big things, then God would do big things like they're little things. I like when God beats the odds. How about you? I like when God proves all the critics and the pundits wrong. How about you? God's in the business of doing big things as if they were little things. Number three this morning, when it comes to our faith... Every decision we make has a domino effect. Those decisions that we make have, a way, have, a, have an effect far beyond our ability to predict or control. We can't predict when, when or, or where or how, but our seeds of faith will reap a harvest somewhere, somehow, someday, and usually it happens when we least expect it. Remember that my decisions, your decisions for the kingdom of God, that they affect the second and the third generations and beyond. Here's a personal story. When I was a little boy, my grandfather's name was Rufus Gaddis, Rufus Memory Gaddis. This was my mom's father. He was a lay Pentecostal preacher, and he would do fill-in preaching for pastors when they were on vacations or when little churches didn't have, uh, they were in between pastors or some of those little churches that couldn't uh, afford a pastor, uh, he would go and, and preach at those for just a, a small stipend sometimes. And my grandfather, on the Sundays that he was not preaching, he would get in his little blue opal and with his same blue suit that he wore every Sunday and his white shirt and tie, and he would drive about 25 or 30 miles from Dawsonville, Georgia, to to Southern Hall County, I lived in a town called Gainesville, he would drive to Southern Hall County and pick me up and he would take me to church with him and then after that we'd go out to the cool cone and we'd get a, a hamburger and an ice cream cone and he would take me home and if he wasn't preaching somewhere the next Sunday, he would do it all over again. Now it would have probably been real easy for my grandfather to say, you know, I'm, I'm up in my 70s and, and for me to get up and go do that and do this, I, it's just better if I just leave it up to his mom and dad. They're his parents. They need to step up and have some responsibility. But my grandfather saw that here was his youngest grandson, that his own daughter and her husband were not going to church like they should, that they were going to the bars, they were going to the clubs, and they were partying till late in the night on, a sa on Saturday nights, get home and, sl and sleep till 12 or 1 o'clock on a, on a Sunday morning or two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon and they were not doing their spiritual responsibilities and my grandfather said that somebody needs to be sowing into that kid's life. But so my grandfather would come and get me and he'd take me to church. My grandfather didn't get to see me come to know the Lord because he died in 1972 but in 1978, six years later, another man walked into my life and said, you know what? I think you should go to youth camp. I want you to go spend a, a week at youth camp with us and I got saved that week at camp and God changed my life and we came home and here's another man that could have 
have said, you know what, I'm pastoring a successful church. I, I don't have time to, to drive 18 miles one way to pick a kid up from a broken home and, and bring him to church. But he said, somebody needs to invest. And so every Sunday he would drive, with, on very few exceptions, he would drive and pick me up and bring me to church. And I'd stay at his home throughout all day on Sunday and he invested in my life. He sowed into me. He, he taught me and he, he corrected me. And, and, and because of those two men, uh, because they saw that, that somebody needed to make an investment, and, and, but they were looking at it in present tense, but God had it in an exponential faith realm, and God was saying that, Rufus, you're going and getting that kid. He doesn't know I'm going to call him into the ministry someday, but somebody needs to sow some seed into him. LG, you need to go get that kid, and you need to get him to camp, because I'm going to call that kid into the ministry someday, and because those two men followed the Lord, because they stepped out in faith, and because they, they did something that then that maybe was looking linear, that you today are reaping the benefits of some men that said, we're going to step out in faith. We're going to invest. You are reaping that because I stand behind this pulpit today as your pastor to preach to you. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying it as a, as a reality that, that you, we may look at things at this moment, but God is always looking at the second and the third and the fourth generations. What does that have to do with us? Those of you sitting out here listening to me, those of you watching by video, don't give up on the things that you're doing. Don't give up on praying for your kids. Don't give up on praying for your grandkids. Don't give up on standing on the Word of God. Don't give up on giving to the Lord. Don't give up on God, you keep sowing the right seeds and at the right time, the right harvest is going to come about. It may not come about in your lifetime. My grandfather didn't see me come to the Lord, but you know what? There are people that have come into the kingdom of God through my life because of my grandfather, because he was willing to sow a seed in my life that he never saw come to pass, but it has come to pass, and that there are people in heaven today that are a direct result of my grandfather because he sowed seed into my life. So grandparents, every grandparent in this room, you keep carrying the torch. You keep fighting the good fight. You keep pleading the blood and praying the power of God down on your grandkids and your kids. If you got kids that aren't doing right by, their, by your grandkids that aren't getting them into church and loving on them and showing them Jesus, then you step up and do it. Do it the best way you can. Parents, you pray over your kids. You read the word of God over them. You pray over them. Don't let your kids get out of your house in the mornings before you lay your hands on them and pray over them. Don't let them go to bed before you pray over them. Don't let them get out of your sight before you pray over them. And don't, don't, if, they, if they don't live at home right now and they live somewhere else, every time you talk to them, you pray over them before you hang that phone up. You keep sowing. You keep sowing. You keep doing what's right. You keep following the, the principles of God's word. And somehow, somewhere, someday, there's going to reap a harvest. There's going to come a harvest because of your faithfulness. God will be faithful to the second, the third, and fourth generation. In fact, some of you are doing work today for the kingdom that's going to have a direct result. You're going to have grandkids and great-grandkids that are going to be followers of Jesus, that are going to be world changers, they are going to be pastors, they are going to be Sunday school teachers, that are going to be doctors and lawyers, and, 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 but they're going to be not only just those things, but they're going to be spirit-filled doctors and lawyers and politicians and preachers and teachers and nurses and you name it. You're doing something today that's going to have an effect for generations. I want you to stand with me. I want us to go to our theme scripture. All right, here again, I want us to read the word, but I don't want us to look past the meaning of the word. You know what I mean? All right, so, just trying to figure out what I had in my pants pocket there. Boarding ticket for my flight this past week got washed. <laughs> Good thing I'm through with that flight, right? Read it out loud with me. Now to him who is able. All right, hold up. Hold up, hold up. I know I told you to read it. I didn't tell you to stop. So that's a word that you want to, it's a key word there. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power. Hmm, are you getting that? Whose power? power. Whose power? God. And who's it working in? God. And because that power is working in us, he's able to do abundantly. You see, his power works in us, and because his power is working in us, he's able to do abundantly. You getting that? 
So what we usually want to do is we want to take the promises, we want to read it this way and work our way down to it. But the way you have to take this one is you got to look at the power that's at work in you and I. That, is, that because of that, then he's able to do abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. Are you getting this? It's his power in us. I was talking to a guy the other day who has a brand new Dodge Charger. Beautiful. I would look good driving one of those cars. I'm really confident that I would. If God moves upon any of your hearts to buy me one, I'll be open to receive it. I think you know I'm being facetious there. We were talking about the, about the car, and he was talking about how awesome it was and how much power it had. And he said, you know, driving down the road, he said, you can flip a switch and go from 300 horsepower to I think it's like six or 650 horsepower at the flip of a switch. That's awesome. Yeah. I'd like to feel that. But I want to remind you of something. That this power that is at work within you has a whole lot more than 650 horsepower. And that any moment that you need to call upon that power, call the Holy Spirit, it is available to you. It is available to help you to do that which you thought you couldn't do. It is available to give you the wisdom that you didn't realize that you had. It is able to give you the skills and the ability to accomplish things that you did not think that you could accomplish. And it all begins by the men and women of God saying, I choose, I make a decision that I'm going to be a man or a woman of God and I'm going to live by faith and I'm not just going to look at it on the, on the linear, but I'm going to look at it as exponential, that I am going to trust the Lord, that my little, when God asks me, when I place it in His hands, it becomes much, that God that my domino uh, de uh, decisions have a great impact on the future and that I, can, that I have this power that is working within me that is able to do far more than I could ever ask or dream or think of because I'm a man and a woman of faith that I choose to believe in the impossible. I choose to believe in a God who's called the Almighty. I choose to believe in a God who's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I choose to believe in a God who holds me in the palm of His hand. I choose to believe believe in a God who will meet my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. I choose to believe in a God that says no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I choose to believe in a God that says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I choose, I choose, I choose to be a man of God, a woman of God and stand on faith. So how are we going to end this? I have no idea. We're going to end and we, I do know how we're going to end. We're going to end it by singing. We're going to lift up our hands in this place. And we're going to say, God, help my faith to be one of those, to be exponential faith, to believe in the impossible. God, help me to be a, a man and a woman or a woman that is willing to speak faith in the middle of a season when I, when I don't have anything. Come on, sing it, Brandon. Oh, walking around these walls, yes. I thought by now they fall. But you will never fail me. We're waiting for change to come. It's called being faithful. Knowing the battles won. For you will never fail me. Yet. I speak in faith in a season of nothing. You promised still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I see.
And I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move. Pastor, why are you preaching a message like this? Because over the next several weeks, I'm going to be asking you to take some steps of faith. Typically, we do our missions convention in the fall of the year, but we delayed it until after the first of the year for a couple of reasons. One, there were some things that we were working on that we wanted to present to you that we didn't have in place yet. We have those things moving forward now. So in a ne- in a couple of weeks on the, not next Sunday, but the following, which will be the 10th, I'm going to ask you to make a faith promise for our yearly missions giving for the 145 missionaries and 20-something, 28 missions organizations that we support. So I'm going to ask you to make that yearly faith promise. At the end of the month, I'm going to talk to you about church planting. God spoke to my heart in August of 15 and said, I want you to plant three churches. One in Missouri Valley, one in Ottawa, and one in the North Sioux, Jefferson, Elk Point area. Some things have been lining up, and we're going to talk to you about church planning on the 24th of this month. of Not this month, but of February. Now, that Sunday, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to helping with, this, with the church plant, with the, with the plant that we're going to do this year. I'm not going to tell you what to give. But this is what I am going to do. I'm going to pray that God will speak to you about what he wants you to give. You may be looking at your finances and saying, how can we do it? Little becomes much when it's placed in the Father's hands. Your little, my little. Remember, five plus two in linear faith equals seven. Five plus two in exponential faith equals 15,000. So we're going to be taking some steps of faith in this month of February. On the 10th, I'm going to ask you to make faith promises for our annual missions giving. At the end of the month, I'm going to present some things to you about church planning. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to help with church planning. So be praying about that, what God would want you to do. So there is a method to my madness, so to speak. But this morning before we go, I'd like to pray a prayer blessing over you. Would you lift up your hands like this right here? God, I ask you to bless these precious people with new faith, stronger faith. God, that you would give them exponential faith. God, that you would help them to see that their little becomes much when it's placed in the master's hands. God, that they would not look at things as impossible, but they would look at things through the eyes of the one who makes all things possible. God, I pray you bless them with peace and joy and righteousness. I pray you make your face to shine upon them. May they live under an open heaven, God, with your abundant favor upon them. May you bless the things they put their hands to, God. May you give them the ground their feet walk upon. May you open doors of tremendous opportunity for them, God. And when they open, may they walk through them boldly and confidently. Give them a wonderful day. Get us all back safely here tonight for our worship night. Give us a great week ahead of us, God. Keep us all safe and get us back safely. And as I pray, Lord, every week for this precious church of mine, may the smell of Jesus and the strong precious fragrance of the Holy Spirit be upon their lives and all they say and do in Jesus name amen and amen I love you family have a great day in the Lord thanks for being here we'll see you back hopefully tonight at 6 30 for our worship night